Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the studio. Uh, my name is Luke. I'm basically the studio producer. Uh, for the audio description, I am a white man with large ginger beard, short black hair, and wearing a grey shirt and stood in front of and on simultaneously a massive television. Um, these talks are live every Friday at 1 pm in the studio. Thankfully, now we are back, which is great, but also beaming out onto Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter simultaneously. So if you're watching online, you can pick any platform you'd like. Um, these talks are our chance to throw open the doors of the studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. They cover everything from innovative research in the fields of creativity and technology to projects in progress with the need of feedback, questions, and curious minds. Quick bit of housekeeping, I think we've covered this for some of you already, but if you've got masks, you can keep them on when you're moving around, have them on when you sat down, it's up to you when you sat down if you want to take them off. And there is some potentially distressing comments that tend to be talk today, so you also have a quiet space to the left just there if anyone needs to take a break in the middle of the talk or after the talk, just pop in there. That's the only reason you know, we should be going into the place, it's just a safe place to go so you can do quite anything uncomfortable. Um, while speakers today are going to be fully remote, because one of them tested, tested positive for COVID, which is uh, going to keep happening and is part of the reason why we do the hybrid version of talks, so we can stay flexible and still have hope people coming and joining us despite the restrictions. Um, and especially big welcome to any of you who are new to the studio. Any hands up in that respect, anyone? No? Because I just skipped a bit about being new to the studio. <laughs> Um, a captioned and recorded version of the talk will be available after the talk has finished. Um, and there's a Q&A at the end, so if you want to ask a question and you're in the space, just raise your hand and I'll come to you. If you're online, use today's talk. In this talk, Dr. Emma Agusita and Dr. Katie Davies, who will appear here shortly, uh, are going to discuss the research project uh, that they've been working on in which film was used to explore and bear witness to the experiences of binational families and couples trying to cope with the UK's hostile immigration environment. Um, trigger warning then is that there is discussion of immigration and family separation as well as stories of separation spoken by the people who experienced them and some moments of distress. Just to warn you that what could be coming up. There's a film in the middle, it's around slide seven. So that's probably one of the key elements where that will happen. But don't worry, the talk is generally really good. <laughs> um, via the magic of the internet, I'm now going to hand over to Katie. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Luke. Thanks Luke. for Thanks having us and thanks everybody for being um, with us today. Um, um, yeah. So, so we're, we're here to talk to you today about our research, research project, project that enabled us to produce a documentary film, film which is called Divided by Law. We're going, we're going to, to talk first about what, what the project, project is um, and, and how and why the project came about. We'll show you a clip from the film. We'll then talk about our research approach and why we chose to work in the way that we did uh, practice-led and, and collaborative approach um, and we'll tell you then about what's happened since we finished the film and also share a little bit about our future plans after which you can ask us questions and um, so about the project and um, the project was funded by the University of the West of England and supported by its Digital Cultures Research Centre which is based at the Pervasive Media Studio and um, to which both Katie and I are affiliated so the main intention as Luke said of the research project was to explore and bear witness to yeah. the experiences of binational families and couples who were trying to cope with the UK's hostile immigration environment. We chose to use film uh, as a method of trying to help advance people's understanding of what happens to partners and families as they pass through the UK Home Office visa application process, um, specifically looking at when families and couples become separated because of that process. Um, so crucially, we wanted to use a documentary approach that would aim to give voice to those um, being directly affected. And we adopted a collaborative approach working with participants, which you'll hear more about. Um, and we received um, support from Reunite Families UK, which is a national voluntary campaign group and network, support network for British and non-UK families who are experiencing um, separation or potential separation um, as a result of the UK immigration rules. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So a little bit more background um, to the subject of the project, uh, the hostile environment for UK immigration. So although hostility to immigration has a long social and political history, uh, in 2012, the then Home Secretary Theresa May made a seminal statement um, that the aim of government was to create a really hostile environment for illegal immigration. Um, and this echoed the 2010 Conservative Party manifesto goal of reducing uh, immigration. 
So although this was designed ostensibly to discourage illegal immigration, a raft of policies were implemented. Um, and in practice, this had a much wider reach and impact, increasing hostility and posing new immigration challenges for um, migrants. So the emphasis of these um, policies were less on being authorised uh, migrants and more on being documented migrants. Um, so being able to prove that you had been given permission to enter and remain lawfully in the UK. We can see the um, impacts of the process um, through the Windrush scandal uh, of 2018, where pre-1971 um, Caribbean um, immigrants to the UK were wrongly detained, their rights denied, they were threatened with deportation um, or actually deported in some cases. And this was because the Home Office um, insisted and demanded on paperwork that was difficult to obtain or impossible to obtain. Um, and this affected a, a large group of people. And so the Home Office themselves didn't keep a record of who was authorised to remain in the UK or give paperwork to Windrush migrants. Um, in the case of our project participants, um, this evidencing requirement means being able to show that you meet the requirements to gain permission to enter the UK or to gain permission to um, remain in the UK with uh, your family members. And as Maya Goodfellow says in the book that she's written about um, the hostile environment, this these policies have resulted in a stitching of immigration checks into every element of people's lives. For example, when accessing public services, or for employment or housing purposes or financial when you're opening a bank account. So these tactics are designed to make people's lives more difficult. And these policies compound and reinforce existing inequality. So as Colin Yeo um, writes in his recent mm -hmm. book, Colin Yeo is an immigration barrister. Um, he's written a book called Welcome to Britain. Um, and he says, you're more likely to be asked to prov provide your immigration status if you're black or minority ethnic, young, poor or female. So effectively, this means many thousands of people are living under the spectre of a hostile system of immigration control that extends to all areas of um, public and private life. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, just wanted to clarify a little bit more about what we mean by family migration. So the migration of family members to the UK can include migrants that come to live with family members that are British citizens or settled residents, and that's known as family um, unification. Or um, migrants can be dependents of family members who are temporary, have two temporary UK visas um, to be in the UK. Our project focused on families and couples where a um, non UK non-European economic area family member um, is seeking to come to the UK to live with a family um, member that's British or is a settled citizen. Could I have the next slide please? Thanks. So why is it then that family separation is so common under the UK immigration regime? Well it's primarily because there are a raft of complex complex uh, visa rules and regulations. Um, so a major obstacle is the minimum income requirement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, the spouse visa minimum income requirement was introduced in 2012, um, and it's resulted in the division of thousands of British citizens from their families and partners. Um, so if you are a British citizen or a settled um, resident and you want to sponsor your um, non-British family member to live with you in the UK, you need to earn a minimum of £18,600 a year. And that rises if you're applying for um, children as well for each child. So this is per person. Um, now, 42% of uh, work people in the UK don't meet that minimum income requirement and actually 57% of women do not meet that. Um, there are also unaffordable fees. So um, the application costs £1,523 currently per person if you're applying from outside the UK. Um, and, and so for additional children, um, you can uh, quantify that, multiply that again. Um, there are also, there's a medical surcharge to um, pay upfront for use of the NHS, which is currently £674 for an adult, £470 per child. There are complex rules on evidencing, as we've um, indicated, um, evidencing your income, evidencing your relationship, ev evidencing your um, immigration status. And there's no guarantee of success. So in 2015, 
around roughly one in three um, applications were refused. There can be processing delays, there's lost documents and so forth, and there is incorrect decision making. So if you look back at the um, the statistics um, for appeals, immigration appeals, but anywhere between 40 and 80 percent of um, appeals are upheld in favour of applicants. If you happen to meet all of these requirements, um, then you would proceed along a five year route to settled status. Um, but to do that, you're looking at a minimum of around £7,000 in application fees and associated costs per person. So you can see why um, this acts as an immense hurdle to many people. And that's why a lot of families become separated. Could I have the next slide, please? Just um, pausing for a moment to think about the evidencing, because this is something that we touch on in the film. And evidence it extends to evidencing your relationship. So visa applicants are required to provide evidenced accounts of the subsistence and genuineness of their personal relationships. Um, Natasha Carver's work, who's an academic Academic at the University of Bristol, um, is, her work is particularly useful and she examines the notion of genuineness in relation to ways that applicants are expected to conform to normative displays of genuineness, so what the Home Office expects relationships to be like. <laughs> um, and failure to conform or be able to adequately evidence this can risk rejection and ultimately separation, so this is further compounding the situation. Could I have the next slide? Thanks. So a little bit about, um, Katie and I are just going to say a little bit about um, our work and why why do this project, why we came to this project. Um, so uh, I'm a, a lecturer and a researcher um, at the University of West of England currently, and I'm a creative producer, and my focus is on media, communications and culture. I've got an interest in social justice, um, civic participation, also co-creative approaches. So my background is in freelance arts and media practice, mainly around community arts and media projects. Um, and I was interested in um, using visual and creative methods to examine experiences of family separation due to um, immigration controls. And that's rooted in my personal experience of navigating the UK immigration system and experiencing separation because of it. So I've done two prior um, research projects. The first re research study was back in 2018 called Visualising Love, and that was looking at the effects of cross-border separation for partners and families, um, but also looking at the ways that um, partners and families use um, how they communicate while they're apart as well. And it tried to reflect on the realities of people's struggles to be together, but also trying to make those visible through the use of creative um, co-production processes. So using illustration, I worked with a, a fantastic illustrator called Radley Cook, um, <coughs> and project produced mixed media works and resulted in an exhibition that sought to highlight the experiences um, and impacts for families affected. The second project was in 2020 and that was um, a project led by um, Catherine Charles Lee at the University of Bristol called Kept Apart. Again, a collaborative co-production project focusing on family separation, using creative processes to explore people's experiences. And these two projects both highlighted the, the really harsh impacts of um, family separation, which range from financial, um, emotional, social, mental, and impacting people's um, physical health as well. So that, that's why I was inclined to um, continue to pursue work in, in this area. And Katie, I'll hand over to you now so you can say about your experience, background. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was very lucky to be working with Emma on this project. Um, it was since seeing her visual love, um, visualizing love, sorry, uh, project that I suggested we work together, partly because um, my research and um, practice as an artist and lecturer looks at different ways in which um, identities can be captured and thought about through um, moving image practice. So um, I, I tend to work with um, individuals or communities whose identities are kind of imposed from above. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And, um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, I've, I've worked a lot with um, people who are going through um, different, different types of transitional um, situations. So I made a film about becoming a British citizen. I've also worked with veterans and I'm, I'm currently working um, with veterans on a research project. But a lot of the time this is about how um, rather than these identities being imposed from above, what's it like for, for different communities to self-identify? Um, and I'm really interested in, in how moving image practice can really um, play a big part in, in, in that process. And then what also 
doing that together really produces for those communities and in terms of learning. Um, so I think it'd be a really good idea now to um, introduce you to the film. We've got a um, 10 minute clip, uh, which we've taken from the center of the film. Um, so I think what's, what's really interesting is um, now you'll get to start to hear of people that we've worked with. And then afterwards, um, I'll be able to explain a little bit more about how we went through that process. Um, and also, hopefully, it'll put in context some of the things that Emma introduced at the beginning of the talk. So, Jack, if it's possible to play that clip. Thank you. Of work, you know, I just said, oh, we're going to see, you know, when we caught an airplane, they didn't really understand that we would be away for so long and such a distance from their mum. So every time they saw, because they were four and five then, and they were like, almost like still like walking like penguins after me, you know, pointing to an airplane, oh, is mummy on that airplane, you know, and things like that. Oh, mummy would love to be here now, wouldn't she? You know, and then they'd feel sad again because they thought of mum. When they wake up at night, they just, you know, cry and missing mum. And um, I feel a bit like the border guard myself. <laughs> separating them and ripping them apart sometimes. It's potentially going to be a year where my husband doesn't see his son and, you know, I, I feel really bad now where he's just fed up with video calls, he's just two, and he's like, hmm, don't want to talk to daddy, I want to go and play, you know, it's like, and he, you can see the disappointment in his face and you can and see sometimes once he's daddy and he's not here, so it's just quite a, a strange, upsetting time because you just don't know. I just think the emotional toll was far more extreme than any of us realized. And we got to a point where my son was like sobbing his heart out every night. Um, and the one, I'll never forget the one evening he came home from school and he just, he was just sobbing and sobbing on the hall floor. And he asked me, he asked me which way is South Africa. And I kind of figured out which way was South. And he tried to open the door and it was locked. And then I realized it was because he, he literally said, I'm going to start walking and I'm not going to stop until I find dad, found dad. It actually makes me want to cry now when I think about it. But the worst was, he would say, I don't understand why dad can't come here. And the worst was having to say to him, I also don't understand. It's a relief when I've reunited them. It's like a weight off my shoulders. Because heaven forbid, if something, if, if something serious happened to, the ch to one of the kids, if it happens when I'm looking after them and she can't come, and all your friends, oh, the, they just can't believe. What, are you sure? Yeah. Are, you sure you done, are you sure you haven't done the right form? That it's going to happen to EU citizens soon. Children will be in the same situation as ours at the moment. They basically said that my separation from my daughter was my own fault because I'd left the UK willingly. It was nothing to do with them. Essentially, I've been, the ultimatum I've been given is, well, you can be with your wife or you can be with your daughter, but you can't be with both. How can you blame someone for conforming to your rules, doing everything they're supposed to do, and then saying that it, 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 their current situation is their fault?
do you think of all the people over the years that have emigrated, British people who have emigrated to everywhere from the Costa del Sol to Australia? So the only difference between people wanting to come to the UK to better their prospects is often nothing more than the colour of their skin or their country of origin. And I think there's multiple kind of cases to be made and arguments to be had around the subject of immigration. The main ob obstacle you've got is people's misconceptions brought about largely by the British press. They're not draining the NHS dry, they're not claiming benefits, they're not entitled to this, they're not entitled to that, you know, you have to get the truth out there. We'll go back to the age-old front page headline, Asylum Seeker Claims £20,000 a year in benefits and has a five-storey mansion, you know, in the suburbs. And, well, sorry, that's just not true. None of it is... It's not even possible, never mind true. I think it's the perception and the understanding that has to change. And how it changes, I'll be honest, I don't know, because it is so widespread at the moment as to how people think and how it's perceived. But that perception has to change for people to understand. I got a letter from the Home Office that I was on immigration bail, so I had to sign into the police station monthly. And it had to be within the specific like 15 minutes or else they would mark that I wasn't there and I was liable to be deported. So that was me being treated like a criminal despite having no criminal record here or in the States or in any country that I've ever lived in in my entire life. And I asked the police every time I was there, like, do you actually know what this is about? What's going on? And they're like, nope, we just get told we have to sign your name down and that's that. I do have this and I have my legal right to be here. I feel like I'm still slightly being held back because I feel like the Home Office is always watching over me. Swan 
Okay. Okay. So next slide, please. Okay, so, um, yeah, to, yeah, to, to, to sort of explain a bit more about uh, what we've just been watching, um, um, when we were thinking about making um, a film um, um, and how it was possible that it could be collaborative, the strategy and the interview framework was developed in consultation with the Unite Families UK on the basis of discussion about finding potential participants. And then some and then resulting the resulting structure reflects that sort of co design of the project, project and people involved in co researchers, researchers such as Joint Council for Welfare and Immigrants, um, Immigration Ministers, and the participants and themselves. themselves. Um, and, and we thought and we about, about a series of questions, questions um, um, posed a series of questions, questions as part of that process, process that were discussed so during, during um, interviews, interviews and throughout the filmmaking. filmmaking. Um, and, 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 and this took this kind of several, several months. months, it all it unfortunately had to happen online. online. Um, it was spread across, across multiple, multiple countries, countries um, during, during lockdown. lockdown. And so not so everyone was present in part of that dialogue at the same time, so that's why we thought this was going to be an important process. Um, so, um, so um, the kind of questions that uh, uh, we were posing, kept, we kept, kept, kept uh, working uh, with, were, um, is there a is shared there... narrative um, that you all want to tell? Um, do you have something in common? And if yes, um, what is it? Um, uh, what would you like people to understand? Who are your audience? And what do you think they already know or don't know? And so the response responses to these questions um, then shape the narrative structure and although each participant came from um, very different backgrounds there were um, there was like a shared um, trauma of separation and and how they were processed by the immigration system and so their testimonies of this experience uh, are central to understanding this sort of disrupt disruptive nature of this of this process next slide please okay um so this uh, again poses um, challenges and opportunities. Um, when, um, first of all, if I start with the challenges, um, Brexit had begun in, in January, 2020, um, and the um, transitional period ended on the 31st of December. So whilst making the film, our participants and the research teams that we were talking to had no idea what the impact of leaving the EU would have upon their status, on their rights to see their families, or their future arrange arrangements. Um, and so throughout their continued process, um, there were no clear indi indications or instructions from the government. Um, and we were constantly discussing this with the Joint Council for Immigrants and our immigration barristers. So not only um, was there the process that Emma laid out initially at the beginning of this talk, the, the trans transitional period, you know, it wasn't, you know, it, it, they couldn't work out the fishing, they definitely couldn't work this out. So it was an extremely difficult time. Um, we just received our funding and we'd started to identify the people that we wanted to work with. And then the first lockdown happened in March 2020. And so physical contact was no longer possible either. Um, so as with life and, and unfortunately apologies, but as with this um, setup that we have now, um, we had to start the filmmaking process online via Skype. So this was even before Zoom. So a lot of our interviews were happening through Skype. However, this, these kind of always in uh, creative processes, I think um, constrictions of, often um, provide opportunity as well. So lockdown did for a short time reveal the realities and distress of family separation as the population at large dealt with communicating via Zoom as a replacement for physical connection and togetherness. This uh, that you're experiencing now in terms of talking to us um, is apparently absolutely acceptable um, to the Home Office in terms of family contact. So, um, so yeah, a lot of people started to understand the real, real, um, the real trauma actually of family separation. So audience awareness and the reality and damage of separation has been much more acute since the start of the pandemic. Uh, in terms of filmic practice, it was difficult um, as the visual and oral aspects of Zoom are limited. Um, however, ideas of care and the importance of physical presence in a world of Zoom calls felt vital and became a reason and one of the reasons why I thought about using um, 16 millimeter film and its processing. Um, but firstly, that was because um, I, I really enjoyed the physical nature um, of film of film itself, which means a great deal of care has to go through shooting, developing and scanning. Um, but this process of care um, 
I felt like could also be translated into a reflection about the individuals we were speaking to and their individual stories. And the film stock itself became a kind of physical link between me, us and them. Um, and it was fragile and precious. Um, so that, that was one of the motivations uh, for wanting to use film. Secondly was um, it, it's aesthetic um, because I've hand processed it as well. Uh, means that the images feel um, as though sometimes when we're looking at sort of empty London as though it could jump forwards or backwards in time. Um, and it's only really to see, as with this image here, it's only really to really see the selfie stick and the masks that you realise that it's not 1962. Um, and that felt really important because um, there felt there like there was a visual reasoning of the social and political effects that both Brexit and COVID-19 were kind of having at the time. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so <clears throat> in terms of uh, outcomes, outputs, uh, and where we are now, our aim is to, and has been um, about engaging multiple audiences um, through this uh, single screen version, and it's been distributed through um, international film festivals and screenings um, and online networks. And it's also um, been part of a case study for undergraduate and postgraduate curriculum, focusing, focusing on um, practice-led methodologies um, practice-led production um, through teaching and, and different learning outcomes. Uh, in May 2021, the film was selected for Oberhausen Film Festival and it got a, a mention, a special jury mention, which was um, fantastic um, and important for everybody that's participated in the film as well. And it's been selected for London Short Film Festival um, coming up this January. Um, and it's currently in selection process for rooftop films in New York. Because I've got a fuzzy COVID brain, I've also forgotten to put in there that um, it, uh, it was shown in Torbor Film Festival as well in um, Croatia in July. And I even went up to Mima in September and presented it as part of a, a festival, a, a weekend of festival up there with um, Andrea Luca Zimmerman. So apologies that those aren't on the slides, but, um, but it's, it's getting out there and, it, and it's, it's got some legs, which is really exciting. Um, in terms of it inc being included in teaching and teaching practice, there's a further goal for the film to act as a resource for educators teaching about the subject of family migration. This is really important for us. And um, so the film has been used by academics um, in the University of Bristol for teaching about family law and transnational families and migration. And by Emma in her teaching around media campaigning practices of communicating for social change. And so finally, we're, we're really hoping to make the film available to the Joint Council for Welfare of Immigrants and Reunite Families in order for it to have some impact for them um, in some way that's useful to their, to their networks. Um, and so um, it can, there can be much more that can happen around the impact, hopefully, that the film can have and the awareness that it could have as well. So you can see the whole film at dividedbylaw.org online because we've put the, the, the full version up on there. Um, and yeah, we, we encourage you to ask us any questions now um, about and to say thank you also to the Face of Media Studio for having us as well today. Thank you. Huge thanks. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, <coughs> really powerful stuff to watch on a Friday afternoon. Um, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> are there any questions from the room or online? Okay. Uh, we have one online. Um, so Melissa says, what have the reactions been to the film from your participants? I mean, I think, I think that, that um, positive, positive reaction, reaction in terms of, terms of that, that I think I there's think a process, a process of, of, of kind of an affirming of... process um, that participants say that, that the film has had in terms of, first of all, being able to be part of something and realising that you're not experiencing this, you know, exclusively that there are other people going through this does definitely sort of bring people some sense of comfort if that's at all possible in this horrible situation that they're going through um, but also I think realizing that the the project was an opportunity to as much as possible have a have their voice heard um, so um, we've got the, the extracts, but also as Katie was talking about having some input into the design process of the, you know, asking them what they thought about how the film should be and what it should include and so forth. So I think we did get a positive reaction um, 
to that did you want to add anything to that katie yeah i mean i and, and also as just to add to what emma's saying um often often talking to so we would we would conduct these interviews there would be about kind of over an hour and i think we did about 12 and um and 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 in, in and in a lot of cases i think it was the first time that a, a lot of people had actually told somebody who's not within the system or a family member um about what their experience was and that's a really important process as well um especially when it's something that's ongoing that's difficult um and that is having having a, a lasting kind of traumatic effect um so yeah I, I think um that that as a process is, is as emma said it doesn't it, it's a lot of uh, i'm just remembering now a couple of them saying that you know i'm not i'm not I, it's, it's great to realize i'm not doing this on my own um i'm not the only one because no one's visible the process isn't visible it's all extremely invisible and it's, it's hidden in plain sight it's 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 uh it's embedded everywhere as emma said and um and it's a very it's a very lonely process as well so just the fact that what the project was doing was pulling was making people people's experiences visible um they they were quite um uh, that was that was something that was really positive that came from it i, I think people were also glad that it would be going out into the world that other people would hear about this that people that don't know about it would learn about it gain some awareness of what was going on because i think and there's definitely not a lot of awareness of how um people are impacted by the process so that's obviously something that was um good as well getting getting this out into the world raising, raising awareness. awareness thank you uh any questions from the room another one from the internet far away there's another one as uh, so this is from amy and um, amy says from the recent separation we've all had to go through would this encourage the home office to look at the rules they've imposed on families as they've potentially gone through a similar experience <laughs> I should point out this no, is a watershed is a charity and we're not allowed to say anything that is uh, like overtly anti <laughs> but please, like an honest response would be great. Yeah. Emma, do you want to get this? Yeah. yeah. So, so as I understand uh, the question is, has it had any impact on the government's decision making processes or their policies around family immigration? Well, I we haven't seen any evidence of that have we katie mm -hmm. i don't think um in fact there are in some ways you can see a hardening <laughs> a hardening of like positions on that um it's i think it's very complicated as well because we've had um we've had brexit so um that has had impacts on public opinion so public opinion has an impact on government <laughs> the government's stance on uh, these issues as well um, and in some ways aspects of Brexit have highlighted um, the fact that we need we need migration we need immigration as a country um, it's it's pretty essential um, and so it's highlighted um, that definitely in the contradictions um, of Brexit um, but in terms of the position of the government you can also see that in if you if you look at the um, statements about border crossings um, channel crossings and that kind of thing um, the discourse really hasn't changed actually so unfortunately um, I think there's still a lot of work to do in trying, in trying to, to engage, engage public, public. Um, support I think for the issue because really at the end of the day that's what kind of moves <laughs> politicians if they think there's enough public support for something mm. what do you say, what do you say Katie? Yeah, yeah I mean I completely agree um it's a good question um and it's one of the things that as 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 uh, the lockdown was happening we really hoped we actually really hoped would shift um would shift policy but as Emma said there was a hardening um and there continues to be what's really interesting is since Brexit um the government has talked about bringing in a points-based system well you heard Emma talking at the beginning about all the things that people had to do before a points-based system so I'd like to know <laughs> if this wasn't a points-based system what one what what one would really look like and I think um or how this could become any harder because it will become harder and it is becoming harder and uh, I think at some point during um the first lockdown there was some discussion in the public media about exactly what it is that anyone who's who's applying um for for these visas and and, and right to remain has to go through partly because 
most of or a lot of the care workers who were working in the NHS, especially doctors and nurses, um, especially during the first ramp um, spike of the pandemic, were making it very clear that um, they were themselves were having to pay as we worked in the NHS, the surcharge of £674 a year to use and access the NHS whilst working there. Um, and the fact that they were they were struggling with the immigration laws whilst also uh, being so vulnerable. And, and, and that story kind of disappeared as quickly as it did appear. Um, so the, there really is, um, uh, as Emma said, there's not really, because there's a lack of, I think, a lack of public understanding around the impact, then um, you don't really understand that these things are happening every day to, to a lot of people until you are the person who meets somebody in a bar who happens to be from another country and falls in love with them. Um, gets married, has children, um, and then decides actually it would be a really good idea to consolidate our family in the UK. And that's when, that's when you know that's one of the op that's one of the examples of when it starts to happen. Mm. Um, so yes, there. Are, as to answer the question, I have not seen. I don't. I'm not aware of uh, of a, an easing or an understanding um, that that this separation has had. In fact, if anything, as Emma said, um, to the, the fact that the technology is here to allow this to happen means uh, they seem to be even keener for families to communicate in this way. Mm. Any other questions for Ava? Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm interested to know if you know if the impact of family separation is equally spread amongst all migrants. So taking into consideration, for instance, EU migrants and non-EU migrants, are there any emergent trends from the data to show, say for instance, that there is a certain region that is disproportionately affected by this phenomenon? So I think that um, it's, it's quite clear that in terms of the impacts, they are very, um, sorry, they are very um, class-based, race-based and gendered, it's quite difficult to get your hands on, on data which points to or points to the particular, whether it's affecting particular countries, it can be quite difficult to get your hands on that data. So I'm not aware of particular country differences, but overall there are definite indications that there are discriminatory practices going on that reflect wider social cultural and economic inequalities globally so there are quite um, high uh, refusal rates for um, particular countries um, that have been reported um, not necessarily through published data but um, people commentating um, working in the migration field and people who are um, solicitors who are supporting um, families through the application process so some of it is anecdotal but there is a general understanding um, that there yeah there this definitely um, there are higher refusal rates um, for particular areas of the world so for instance um, there are countries in West Africa which have particularly high uh, refusal rates in terms of the um, question of um, European migration so up until up until Brexit and after the transition period and and so forth. Um, EU migrants uh, came under a different pathway um, of migration, so didn't have to go through the UK immigration process if, if they were going through as a family member. Um, and that's, that's what's changed now with Brexit. So um, I think what will happen is that we will begin to see um, those impacts hitting um, EU migrants and their families um, in, in the coming years so uh, and it's been something that certainly people working within this field are really aware of people who are supporting families and um, if they're working um, in the legal field um, or in advocacy or campaigning are really aware that this is coming um, that this is going to have a huge impact and it's going to exacerbate the situation there's going to be more families in this position as we said in the film Sorry, Katie, did you? <laughs> yeah, and, and just to follow up from that, I think that period where that, that change fully happens is March 2022. So it's um, it's imminent and um, yeah, and, uh, and and then that will be the, the, the shift so that the, the, the process is the same for 
um, for anyone from Europe as well as outside of Europe. So that's when, so, um, and, it, and what's quite amazing is I've, I think once I heard an advert on the radio saying it, you need to think carefully about whether you've registered for settled status if you are an EU citizen within the UK, but it's not, it's given the effect and the impact that it's going to have, um, there really hasn't been a lot of um, a lot of coverage of this and about the importance of it as well and the effect that it will have. So um, yeah, it's quite it's quite surprising. Any other questions? Good. There's one more online. Um, so Melissa asks, did you have to think about triggering trauma when you were recording the report? <clears throat> So was the so question, the question sorry, sorry, did you did have you to think about triggering trauma? trauma? I didn't get the last bit of the question. Um, when you were recording people, so I guess the people that were being recorded with them. Um, Katie, did you want to stop? stop? Yeah, we, yeah um, we did uh we did sort of I mean all of the all of the conversations start off, you know, um with we're you know, we're gonna be talking about don't tell us anything that you know is gonna be really difficult that you're going to have to sit and think about on your own. Or after this conversation, um, we're not we want we're wanting you to, to share with us what you think is important, but not to the point where it's it's going to be difficult for you, um, because again, it's um. But what 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 again? What we found is that people were were kind of so uh, um, were, were thought thought that it was so important for this really to be kind of um ex expressed. And the interesting thing here is. And because we were asked this question um, and had to clear this with our ethics committee as well, is that um, this is a process that the British government are putting people through daily and they're not asked this question, you know, and that's what's really interesting about this. This is this is a legal process, which is extremely traumatic and and all they are doing is saying this is my experience of interacting with the Home Office. So um, it's it's a really um, it's this is, and this is the thing that it's really important to get across is that um, is that it, this is really distressing and it's completely legal and it's happening all the time, and um, and and that's the, that's the thing we really really want to make people aware of is that you will you could very much find yourself in this position tomorrow because as we all know <laughs> life throws lots of curveballs around and it's it's completely unfair and unequal and it's really common it's really commonplace and it's happening now um so in terms of um, being able to discuss that it was a real release i think for people rather than than kind of a trigger because the, the triggering part is is not only experiencing it but the fact that it's it's muted silenced and invisible so we were careful when we were working with people but what we found is that, um, that there was a real release for them and and that worked in a really positive way thank you uh, we're running short on time, we've got space for one more, if anyone's got one, any more? Uh, Katie, Emma, this might be a tricky one to answer, but I'm conscious that we've talked about some uh, pretty heavy stuff today, and often it's <laughs> to try and close out the space with something that some way people can learn more or something they can do. Um, is there anything you, could, you might suggest in terms of lobbying, protesting, um, charities, groups to look at? I think, um, I think um, so, so it's, important it's important to acknowledge that there are groups working in this area. So Reunite Families UK, um, they are doing a lot of campaign work, especially around the minimum income requirement and trying to get that abolished. Um, so Reunite Families UK got a website, they've got a Facebook group. Um, they're actively um, running different campaigns at the moment. So I think if people want to learn more about it, um, if they want to find out what they can do um, in terms of, um, you know, calls to action, um, Reunite Families is definitely a good organisation to look up. Um, there's also an organisation called Britsit who are um, also campaigning on the same issue. So I would say that um, those organisations, plus the Joint um, Council for the Welfare of, of Immigrants, um, is doing really important work also looking at the minimum income requirement but um, more broadly looking at the issue of um, family um, separation so those are um, you know at least three organizations who um, I would recommend looking at um, if you want to learn more but also looking at potential actions you can take and how you might support the cause. 
That's great. Thank you. And I would like to say a big thank you to Emma and Katie, if we may. A little round of applause, please. <laughs> and before we move to part, uh, next week's talk is by studio resident Ella Mesmer. Ella's been creating a project which combines dance, aerial storytelling, and tech, and is going to be the talk is going to be hosted on Topia, which is Ella's very own world. Um, uh, it explores identity, heritage, imposter syndrome, and privilege inspired by the life cycle of butterfly. Um, you can get news on that and all our future talks on our Twitter page, BMC the UK, at Facebook Music Studio on Instagram. Subscribe to this YouTube if you're watching online, and subscribe to the newsletter on the website. Thank you for being here today online as well. We'll see you all again, same time, same place next week. Thank you. Thank you.